session today is Hidden Participants and Unheard Voices, uh, TEKA and Climate Change Research in the North. Our presenters are Maya Hitomi and Phil Loring. So it looks like this is going to be our crowd. Um, hello, everybody. I'm sure you can see me now. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about TEK, Climate Change Research in the North. You already got the introduction from Megan. Um, I'm Maya Hitomi, and you all, all probably know Dr. Phil Loring. He's sitting over in the corner here, just out of, out of sight, probably. Um, and let's get into this. So first, let's talk about, let's do a quick introduction and some quick acknowledgments. So, hi. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory here in, in Saskatoon and homeland of the Métis. That means that we need to recognize that we are all treaty people and that we need to work collaborative, collaboratively with, our, with all, all people on this land to work towards reconciliation for the benefit of our research, but also for the benefit of all Canada. Also, I'd like to acknowledge that the funding for this project came from the Rural Policy Learning Commons. If you have the opportunity, support people who support research. So let's jump right into this. We have three research questions and they're pretty straightforward. They are simply, is any, everyone's knowledge represented, represented as it should be in traditional ecological knowledge literature? What are the characteristics of the traditional e ecological knowledge as presented in the literature? And is there any relationship between author's gender and the characteristics of the, the, liter of the knowledge presented? Of course, as always, we have to define a few terms. <laughs> uh, and that's what we're going to do here. So here, traditional ecological knowledge, as we defined it, was most closely akin to uh, that definition found in Huntington 2000 that was saying that traditional ecological knowledge need not be indigenous knowledge. As you can see here, you can have local knowledge, farmer's knowledge, hunter's knowledge, a whole bunch of different types of knowledge. The idea is to have knowledge that is experience-based, gained through use of resources or interaction with the lands. When I say everyone, Obviously, we can't sit there and dissect every single group while we are uh, looking through the research. So we sp specifically looked at gender and age. So men and women, youth versus elders. Author's gender. Gender is kind of a tricky thing sometimes. So when the names weren't clear, I tried to find their university affiliations. Most universities have a nice little blurb about the person which helpfully has their pronoun preferences, that's their gender, or they have a photo online because Google is really, really creepy, and I was be able to guess from there. Those who I couldn't make an educated guess or I thought that, that the issue was ambiguous, I just marked as unknown. So literature. When we're saying literature, this is peer-reviewed journal articles available through the U of S library, which is to say, you might get slightly different results if you try this in a different library with different uh, agreements because copyright is a pain in the butt, even for academics. And then represented or presented in, not in the literature base. This was kind of the most complicated thing. What counts as, as knowledge being represented, right? We took this as being if it's talked about in a way that you can discern some piece of knowledge from it. So if you said, for example, that uh, hunters are changing their hunting patterns because, of, because ice is becoming less reliable. That is an excellent piece of knowledge that's represented in the literature. If you said this group did, does, any verb like that based on their knowledge, that was considered re represented. However, talking about entire towns or talking about broad cultural, the cultural things didn't count as knowledge in this case. So let's go through quickly through the methods. We did a systematic review and we looked at peer reviewed journal articles published between January of 1990 and September of 2017 when this project started. 
they had to present TEK and climate change. And this, they were included whether or not they collected the, the traditional ecological knowledge themselves. So literature reviews were perfectly fine. And they were systematically reviewed using Google Scholar. We would have liked to do more sources. Unfortunately, we ran out of time and funding. Saturation was considered at three pages of no results. So that means that when I had three consecutive pages of Google Scholar that had nothing new, I gave up there and called it, we called it a day for those terms. The first 10 pages were always reviewed, however. And here are our search terms. Traditional ecological knowledge, traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge. Of those, Local knowledge was the least useful, and that was simply because the term local and the term knowledge, both very regular terms that are used very commonly within the literature space across many different fields. So it quickly got, uh, how, how do we say, Out, like, outstripped in size, like it was too, too broad. Then on this side, we had climate change and environmental change. And again, environmental change was probably the less useful one, because when we started talking about environmental change, a whole lot of geography and geology papers started, started to come up. Either way, I did my best. Saturation was at three, at three, three pages without any new results. And this is our lovely little diagram of just where things happened. So you can see there that we, ha we had a total of 991 articles identified. That is already excluding things that weren't available at the U of S. So if I couldn't click a link and follow it, then it wasn't considered identified. Then there are papers identified for the re re reference, reference, eh, reference list, which you'll see in a moment. We removed de duplicates, screened the, the titles and abstracts, and then did a full text search, just to make sure that we, they're talking about what we want them to talk about. At this stage, papers that were excluded, nine of them were not to do with climate change. 15 of them were not peer reviewed. These were kept in simply so that I could go through the reference list because a lot of large international agreements and large international projects that were reported in gray literature used, uh, used that medium, but relied heavily on scientific data. So I kept those in as long as I could to make sure that I got as much of the, that as possible. One of them was pre-1990, despite the fact that it was published in the 2000s. Um, and 24 were not traditional ecological knowledge. Then we realized that we were in over our heads <laughs> and we decided this to reduce the scope. Originally, we decided to reduce, reduce the scope to North America, the North American Arctic. However, I like to have safety margins around everything. So I said that I'll keep looking for everything in the circumpolar Arctic or roughly therein. This can be refined more acutely for future publications. Then we had a total of 85 papers remaining. Results in discussion. Here's the histogram of the years of publication for the included literature. This low, this might indicate that we're just catching the, the tail end of the year. So publication still to come. This is our outlier, I guess. But it looks like it might be plateauing or we might need more data. We'll see. Literature characteristics. Male authors outnumbered female authors two to one. Um, so there were 120 female authors, 300 or 230 male authors, and 23 that I couldn't classify. Literature reviews were common. 18 of the, the final inclu included 85 were literature reviews. Purposive sampling was the by far the most common, or some version of that. So this included things like key informant interviews. Um, going in with trying to identify expert before collecting data, anything of that sort was considered purposive for, for this. 
about half didn't describe their sampling at all. Interviews were the most common, followed by focus groups and a participant observation. Other methods were also peppered throughout the literature. So things like mapping through GIS, collecting name, local names in local languages, um, do it, running workshops and, fo and focus groups that were trying to fill out a, a, a local map were all regularly, regularly appearing in the literature, but by far it was interviews and focus groups. So studies were mostly in the North American Arctic because we limited to the Arctic and this may be due to language. We were doing our search in English, which means that some Scandinavian countries that focus their research on the Sami or cultures in their, their Arctic may have been excluded. Likewise, there was a mention by Stamler that in Russia, there is a general skepticism towards climate change, and that most research is as the result of uh, resource extraction and impacts of resource extraction on local communities, which means that all of that information may have just been excluded by the way that we uh, defined our boundaries. Piecemeal publications were, were very common, and by a piecemeal publications, I mean any larger project that was split into smaller parts and published in different journals or different publications. So this means that this meant that if you ran a six year project uh, in one place and you published the, the data for the first two years and then the data for the second two years and there's that data for the third two years, that was piecemeal. As was if you did, you, cert, you did a, a quick project in say Inuvik and then you also included, you published that and then you published a second thing from Iqaluit with that, that was all considered to be piecemeal. This isn't to say that piecemeal publications are good or bad, but some of the problems were that it wasn't always acknowledged when they were piecemeal publications or when the participants were already included in, in literature, which makes it very hard to get novel insights. Case, stale, uh, case studies failed to locate knowledge almost entirely. For the most part, case studies came up when in literature reviews or talking about specific issues, they, they were used as local examples to illustrate a topic. And apart from just having where the, uh, where the, the knowledge was coming from, the knowledge wasn't located as to whether it came from elders, or whether it came from hunters, whether it came from men, whether it came from women. And literature reviews were sometimes circular. When I say that they were circular, I mean that one specific piece of, of uh, traditional ecological knowledge might have been cited in a literature review, but the citation for that, liter uh, for that piece of knowledge didn't go to the original source that collected that, that piece of traditional knowledge, but instead to another literature review that went to another literature review. And sometimes I had to try to trace it back through five or six steps, or sometimes it didn't even go back to a place that was, connect that was collecting actual knowledge which is a little bit worrying, even though it is common practice across most academic fields. So another thing that I noticed while I was reading the, the, the texts were that there is a bit of an inv invisible college going on. So invisible colleges are just groups of authors who collaborate, support each other, and cite each other's work. They're networks of, of academics just like we're networks of academics here at the University of Saskatchewan, these colleges just don't exist in a physical location. They are extremely influential because you can cite each other's work. You're often working on same or the same or similar topics. And this means that you can collaborate and make really big connections. They can inf influence entire fields of study. They can push fields forward by see, seeing a network of collaborators pushed into a new direction, but they can also hold fields back when they have, when they have uh, the invisible college in using ethics or methods that are behind the times. We identified one or possibly two invisible colleges. One was around Ford and the other was around Huntington. 
and I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Loring to talk about this beautiful thing that shows those colleges. Thank you, Maya. So, so when we were sort of um, shoulder deep in the literature that we were reviewing, and Maya first told me that she um, had the sense that there were these hidden colleges in this literature, um, I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to do a network analysis of authorship? And now, so the premise here uh, is that these papers that we've identified represent a body of knowledge, a body of knowledge that is circumscribed um, by the particular search terms and inclusion criteria that Maya described. So what I wanted to investigate about this particular body of knowledge uh, is co-authorship and uh, what co-author relationships among academics um, does this body of knowledge um, exhibit. That's, that's meaningful not because it shows us who's working with whom, but it shows us the author to author relationships of the people who are sort of who are writing these papers. So they are in control of the discourse. They are in control of the terminology, the language, the interpretation, what's being presented and what's not, and so forth. <clears throat> so we did a network analysis um, of co-authorships on the paper. Uh, and what you see here um, really did reinforce um, this intuition that Maya had about there being invisible colleges in these papers. Um, each node represents an author. Um, you see some people, some outliers here along the bottom of this is probably one paper. This is probably one paper. People who worked together on a one particular project and are sort of separate from the rest of this community of practice. And then as Maya said, there's two clusters in this network. One that at the center is James Ford from McGill. And then at the center of this network is Henry Huntington. Um, and it, they, they look very different. Um, and we haven't really looked at what the structure of these networks might mean yet, but you can see the size um, of these nodes in, indicates um, something called centrality. And a centrality between the centrality and network studies is a measure of um, how important individuals are for connecting people to each other. Um, and so uh, clearly um, in the sort of paradigm of co-authorship that Henry Huntington appears um, to pursue when he's working with his collaborators, he is extremely important um, to connecting different groups of practitioners who are working with traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and then on, and over here you see um, sort of a different structure where uh, the red color here indicates more papers. And so you see James Ford clearly with the highest number of papers in the sample. Uh, but here the centrality is less. And so the people aren't connecting others. Nobody here is more important than anybody else in terms of connecting this network. Um, and it's, it's a denser network as opposed to this being uh, generally sort of a, a network where more groups of people are being connected by an individual. Uh, there's no, I'm not making any sort of normative claims about these structures and what they might mean, uh, but it is always important to start to recognize this and think about who's working with whom, are there any voices that are being left out, um, and, and we have to at least be cautious uh, of that we may be circumscribing or even limiting the discourse that we use to talk about or to represent other people's knowledge um, through these relationships and collaborations that we have. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more, and I think, uh, and for future research, to really dig into that, you could even go so far as to do a network analysis of citations, uh, which would be a pretty large undertaking, um, but one that I've seen done in other areas to great effect. Okay. So let's return quickly to the research questions. The first question was, is everybody's knowledge being included, represented as it should? Uh, in the literature base? And my answer is simply, I don't know. No? And the reason for that is that only three of the included 85 studies reported both demographics of, for gender and for age. 13 reported some demographic information. Usually this was either gender or age, but not both. And then 69 included no demographic information at all. And we only looked at two demographic things, like two demographic pieces of demographic information. If we were looking at, say, income or influence in the community or role or anything else, we would have been even more hard pressed to find information breakdowns on that. Only 23 presented clear participant numbers. Most often, this came in forms of we did X number of studies or X number of interviews with X number of people. And then we had 
focus groups, we ran six, to six focus groups that had between five and 15 people, which immediately loses how many people we talked to or where that knowledge came from. Of those that reported the, the participant numbers, they included 166 women and 317 men. This is including one study that looked at only women. Mostly people over the age of 55 were identified, usually elders or hunters was the term that they were associated with, and only one youth under the age of 18 was clearly identified as a youth and interviewed. So our second question was, what characteristics are there to the literature that's presented here? And I said the vulnerability framework. That was because the knowledge included focused on observations of climate change and vulnerabilities, sometimes with adaptations or mitigation in mind, but almost always was based on observations of climate change and vulnerabilities to climate change. Knowledge was collected primarily from elders and, resort and animal resource users. So in this case, there were very few people that were identified for other roles. And if they were identified, they were never given a label as such. In Europe and Asia, herders were the most commonly uh, interviewed people. Knowledge tended to focus on the largest mammal that was hunted, which to the point where I had to come to Phil in his office and be like, wait, so is harvesting a thing in the Arctic? Um, which means that knowledge from harvesters, small game hunters and fishers was largely absent. Developing community-based uh, community-based research skills was an important role in a lot of projects. It was commonly mentioned. However, the results of this are somewhat unclear because those studies have not made their way into ac the academic literature. Specifically, I think what is happening is that smaller studies are being aimed at the, resor the resource needs or the, the climate main needs of the communities in the far north, and those are being used locally and held in local archives. However, they could be very useful for other small communities in the Arctic, even if they come from different places and different trains and different cultural approaches, because they offer some insight and they're not being utilized yet. So gender impact. Was there a relationship between gender and the characteristics displayed? Seems it, yeah. Specifically, large collaborative projects were more disproportionate than non-large uh, projects, which means that the larger the project, the more males were involved with it. Women-led projects seem to include community-based guides and resources as authors more often than male-led projects. And women-led projects didn't appear to be any better at recruiting or collecting data from women. One interesting note about authorship, there was one study from Northern Europe that said that they didn't want to burden their participants with the role of author, which seems a little bit interesting. It, that could point to a cultural difference between here and there, where authorship here is seen as particularly valuable, and it could be seen as somewhat of a detriment there. So research context. This is just what I call my limitations and strengths. I don't like those terms because it seems to suggest that you can make a perfect study. You can't. So research context. This is an outside perspective. I am not from the School of Environment and Sustainability. I was just really fascinated with this project and me and Phil happened across paths. And this is focused on the circumpolar Arctic. 
Articles identified here, we're only using Google Scholar. Again, it would be useful to use other, school, uh, other, other sources, such as WorldCat or other, other catalogs, to be able to verify that this is a representative depiction of the knowledge. Peer-reviewed articles were only included. So large gray literature was not included, books were not included, and specifically, books are worth noticing because there is a significant, a, a number of significant books that were identified during this that were just excluded. One of those was a, uh, an anthology headed up by Berkus. That was a lot of academic literature, but it wasn't a peer-reviewed journal article, so didn't meet, meet the criteria of this study. And then there is a considerable, considerable amount of literature that's adjacent to this that we just didn't include. So that includes things like resource management, co-management, law, and there are entire, entire fields that look at very similar things that weren't included, such as anthropology, ethnobiology, ethnobotany. These could be really useful resources to researchers in this area, specifically when we're talking about ethnobiology and ethnobotany. When I came across those uh, articles that focused mostly on identifying what plants and what, bio, uh, what animals are in the area, what their uses are, how they're important to the local populace. They did a really, really good job on making sure that they had demographic break breakdowns on all of their participants. So this might be a good way to inform practice in this area. Discussion. So if you could just quickly go back to yeah. this slide, I just wanted to, to add one point um, because in literature reviews such as the systematic reviews, uh, there's often a lot of discussion about okay, why did you include gray literature or why didn't you include gray literature? And we were being really strategic in this case because there's a, a very significant call among academics to do better at bringing local and traditional knowledge into academic discussions. And so focusing here just on peer review literature and looking at things like authorship is an indicator of that. There are certainly good reports and books that may differ from this and certainly um, other areas of practice other communities of research practice that may be doing this in a slightly different way ethnobiology ethnoecology has a long history of working with local knowledge holders um, and may in fact it would be a research question may be doing better so to speak at at locating the knowledge that the literature is representing uh, but I think it's really important to just emphasize that this is intended as a litmus test to, to see how we are doing at our own job and to see areas that we as academics who are earnest about bringing uh, local and traditional knowledge into academic studies, how we can do better at that. So a couple of points that I wanted to talk about um, from this. Um, one of the real interesting challenges that, that we've encountered in thinking about this, and, and there's, there's been some significant amount of ink dedicated to this topic, is how are experts defined um, in research about in, in local and traditional uh, knowledge, whether it's ecological or otherwise, um, and, and how are they defined and by whom? And we started at the beginning, Maya noted that there are all these different terms uh, in this talk that bear a little bit of time to, you know, to, and clarity for how we're defining them. Uh, expertise is a really important one, and I think that uh, people have really been circling that. Um, and, and I think that it's been difficult to, to figure out how to, how to work with that concept of expertise, uh, because we're faced with this really difficult balance between community sovereignty on the one hand, uh, and a mandate that we have, at least that anthropologists and social scientists have um, as a matter of professional ethics, to elevate marginalized voices. And so what I mean by that is that on the one hand, it's really important that we empower and respect a community's authority to identify its experts, to identify its elders. This is a received status. This is a, this is a very important status. And when community ought to be able to identify and define who speaks for them. Uh, but at the same time, that can't happen in a way that it marginalizes people's voices. And, and, and thinking about the fact that this literature only represents or largely represents just large mammals is a really great example. Um, you know, in, in Arctic households, uh, my experience is in Alaska, um, the women in the households generally have a real lot of experience, hand-on experience with these animals as they're butchering them. They see the animal condition. They see what's in their guts. They see parasites. Uh, they have a lot of knowledge about changing animal condition that perhaps we're missing. 
Uh, perhaps that's knowledge that we're missing that could really help us understand how things are changing in the North. Um, similarly, um, the, the focus on species, if we're just looking at large species and we're not looking at botanical knowledge, uh, that again is often held by women um, who may be harvesting greens, berries, and so forth, um, that what are we missing about large-scale ecosystem changes that we could be learning from our partners who are on the ground all the time and have the opportunity to see so much more um, than we do? I think we need to really think about this. And in fact, this is not just a, an issue for us and academics to tease apart, but to sit down with our partners and say, we're worried we're missing something. How do we negotiate this sort of razor's edge um, of defining and locating expertise? And then I also wanted to sort of circle back to this observation about um, the research and that there's a claim in a lot of this research and a, a really, you know, a, an honorable intent to use research on, that engages with traditional ecological knowledge to help build community capacity, to do this work, to do studies, um, and to bring community capacity for bringing this into science. If this is what people are really trying to do through their studies, it, I, it's really you know, concerning. Why aren't we seeing those studies in our review too? Uh, they're not making it, and perhaps it's because this capacity is going towards writing things like local reports um, that maybe a local subsistence board might be using or a local tribal council might be bringing to a policymaker. And that's really important, uh, but there may, as Maya said, be a missed opportunity um, to, to be bringing that knowledge together uh, and to be bringing those approaches that are being sort of co-defined and co-created by empowered local practitioners into academic discourses on traditional knowledge so we can really address some of these other challenges as well. So references, if you're not going to get slides, this one might be a good place to take a screenshot. Uh, this first one is where I got my definition of in, invisible colleges. And then these two might be a little bit useful, or the last one should be familiar to everybody, I imagine. And then we can end here with our contact information and we can take some questions. Yes, that would be great. And, and I think as we said at the very beginning, we'll start with some questions from online. Um, and if, if any questions have come in and then also ask for some questions in the room. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, and for those watching online, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, there's none up yet. So if anybody in the room has any there, we can start with. So do you guys have any questions? Yes. I was wondering, what about the affiliation? Uh, who is the expert? Where, uh, where are they affiliated? Are you in Canada, United States, or Europe? OK, so you're asking as to the affiliations, like the university affiliations yeah. of the authors in our study. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't really look into that. I noticed a couple of names that popped out. But for the most part, it was kind of scattershot across Canada for the North American, uh, across Canada and the United States for the North American literature. Um, and then in, uh, in Europe, I believe that there was, there's the Sami University. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce where it, where it is, where it's from. Yeah, in Tromsø. And that, that was a clear outlier in Europe. It's a good question, the, the author affiliations, and I think just because of the way that we um, narrowed our field down geographically in terms of the studies, that it's probably not terribly surprising that we see the majority of studies from Canada and um, the United States. Um, it would be a really good exercise. Um, I mean, there's lots, of, I think, of, of new uh, research that we could do um, from here, um, a network analysis of citations to see if there really are any just sort of discursive constraints in the body of literature would be good you know are we are we um, impacting how we write about these things and maybe even you know skewing how we represent and misrepresent knowledge is one question um, but um, but you know understanding if we were to open up geographic area and, ha and have more resources to do so it would be really interesting to see if you see a differential for example between knowledge about the global south being represented by authors from the global north uh, that would be a, i think a compelling hypothesis um, a similar one would be do you have people in the arctic writing about the arctic or do you have people outside of the arctic writing about yeah. the arctic and we do have the data to look at if we wanted to, um, to to answer that question but who all of this has been about who's representing whose knowledge and so it's a good question and we do have a question 
from the uh -huh. online folks. Um, is from Naomi Mena, and she wants to know um, that she noticed you had some information about hunting from Asia in Europe. Were there other mentions from other parts of the world? From herding, are you talking about, or hunting? Hunting. hunting. Okay. Uh, most of the, the literature that I saw that was talking about hunting was actually in the north, uh, in, the, in the, the American and Canadian Arctic. There was uh, a clear focus on herding in the, in the European and Russian Arctic. In terms of uh, hunting knowledge from those areas, that was considerably less noticeable. For the most part, they were just referred to as resource users at that point. And I'll, I'll add to that, you know, it, it's having now been a, a part of a handful of different sort of pan-Arctic um, reports for, from organizations such as the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, uh, we do repeatedly run into this challenge of having limited access to uh, any literature that is being published in Russian. Um, uh, Maya is correct, often it has a very sort of different spin on it. It's about resource use and impacts of resource development, not change, uh, when we do find that. Uh, but I think that the, the language issue is, is, is a challenge and remains one. I feel like it's one that people have been commenting on for just about as long as I've been uh, had a professional career in this. Herding was not talked about at all in the North American Arctic. However, uh, throughout Asia and Europe, herding was very commonly cited, even, to, even in studies that were outside of our original area of, of the circumpolar Arctic. So down as far south as, uh, as China and Mongolia, we're still talking about herding. And then Africa had a large herding uh, literature base as well. That was just largely skipped over because of our criteria here. Um, we have another question. Um, so it is, have you analyzed Health Canada and similar US health authority in regard to traditional food studies? No, but it's a great idea. Yeah, um, yeah you know, thinking about that literature, I've I'm much more familiar with it in the States. Um, the, that, that literature, say for example, from the US Department of Agriculture and the US Environmental Protection Agency and others, rests pretty heavily on um, reports that are produced by the state of Alaska, um, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, which are very extensive, are their household surveys. And um, I would venture a guess that their demographic representation about what traditional foods are being used is much better um, in terms of gender issues. Um, the, in terms of Canada, I, I don't have an answer to that question. I, uh, I bet, imagine there are people on this campus who would and others. I, from the literature that I looked at, I found a couple of uh, published articles that ended up in our, our they didn't in, it weren't included because most of the time they weren't actually focused on climate change. And if they were, they were, talk, they were talking about climate change in a much larger context. So for example, they would be looking at between their last study and this study, what changed? Whereas we were looking for things that were largely based on climate change knowledge about the, the environment uh, in that time period. So that kind of got missed in a lot of cases. I didn't see anything from Canada that was in peer-reviewed uh, peer academic journals. And most of the stuff from the States was also not in peer-reviewed academic journals from what I, I remember. Most of it was actually based in reports from the USDA and, the, uh, and uh, many government agencies in Alaska. We had another question in the room, if there's not an immediate one online. No, go for it. Yeah, do you want to go back to the histogram? Because yeah. I have some thoughts on that, actually. And I'm just wondering, for any questions in the room, can you repeat the question before, just yeah. we can't quite hear the question. Absolutely. So the question that we just had was, was uh, asking about the, to talk a little bit more about the timeline we have for publication. And so the criteria for inclusion were from 1990 on to as of September of, of 2017, which is when we started and started running the searches. Um, and, and this is the histogram of the number of publications for, for each of those years. Did you want to say anything about it? No. I uh, so, so, I mean, I think 
you know, what we see here is at first not surprising to anybody who's been sort of working in rural northern communities about climate change is you see a ramping up in terms of the number uh, of studies where people are engaging with local sort of knowledge holders to talk about environmental and climatic change. It appears to plateau in terms of the, the number of studies published and that may just be that this is we've reached sort of a saturation level for the number of studies th that these communities of practice are able to crank out from year to year uh, right and we don't necessarily it would be interesting to see we could look to see if we have how often we get new authors over time to see if we're getting new entrants into this community of practice or if we have the full community of practice that we showed you in that network early on. Uh, this why 2016 is so low is, a, is in a bit of an anomaly to both of us. I, I think it's a research question that we're going to have to reflect on and, and maybe try to do some targeted searching to see if there are papers from 2017, for example, that didn't come in and why. Is it because they're using different terminology? Has, has the community of practice moved on? Are they using different words for this? Are they talking about it in different ways? Are the studies focusing on different aspects of the problem now? Um, you know, it would be interesting to know if do these groups of people feel like the knowledge has been collected and we can move on to the next step or something? I don't know. That's just speculation. Um, but it would be really interesting to know why um, there's so few really recent papers. Does that answer your question? Marvelous. Uh, one thing to note about this is that each of these bars is not necessarily one year. It's actually two to three years. So in this, in this case, it's not just that 2016. It's because, it might be because this included 2017 as well. So yeah, it's a running average, which means that it could be just low because we cut it off halfway through that three-year uh, bar. Okay, um, we have a question from this end. Okay. Um, what do you think are the implications for the authorship networks that you noticed from your study? I think the idea of controlling discourse seems to have real impacts on whose voice gets heard. Yeah, you know, I think there's a, a couple of different places. Could you bring yeah. us back to that slide? Um, there's a couple of maybe one, one or two more things I'll say about this network, and I apologize that I left the, the key off, which would show you what the colors mean. Um, but again, you know, to answer that question, I just want, I want to reiterate, this doesn't represent a community of practice of people working on climate change with local folks in the North American Arctic. This represents the network of authors responsible for this body of knowledge, the body of knowledge being a defined set of publications as defined by those inclusion criteria, right? And that's important, I think, from a dis discursive perspective. Uh, I think that um, what we can say, you know, we, we, when we read these papers, we feel an emphasis on with own language like vulnerability. And there have been people who have commented on that before us. Um, Dr. David Natcher, for example, has a paper that, that um, from a handful of years ago um, that comments on, on the challenge of using this language too much. Um, and, and it, you know, admitting that it's, it's an important framework to, to, to talk about. Um, I think, you know, what we've shown here is that it, we, it would require a little bit more robust testing, but there's different approaches. There appear to be different approaches to working together to doing this research. And I think that, uh, you know, there's a striking difference in terms of the look of the network between uh, Henry Huntington and James Ford. And again, I'm not making any normative claims about that, um, but I would say we all should look at this as practitioners if we feel like as though we're researchers who are probably on this map or want to be on this map. Uh, it's something that we need to be aware of, this idea of, of hidden colleges, this idea that um, if we don't branch out to try to bring other people, other voices, especially local authors, um, local you know, authors from the community, tribal councils, local experts, elders, whoever it is, onto the papers with us, we are going to um, probably even if not unwillingly or unwittingly start to narrow the, the words we use to represent other people's knowledges and that could become problematic. I don't say, I don't believe we have any indication in the literature that it has become problematic, but I think that there are signs in, the, in this body of knowledge that it's something that we need to be on the lookout for. Yeah. Um, in terms of invisible colleges, this I saw, I similarly saw nothing in the literature that seems to indicate that these 
uh, invisible colleges are acting in a specific way to advance a specific agenda. Um, where I got this term from, uh, it was very clear in the psychological literature. It was very clear where that came from and what the agenda was. In this case, there wasn't so much of an agenda, except for that a lot of the methods of the, the specific groups seem to look very similar to one another. And the way that they approach their study looked very similar to one another. So if you are in or you think that you might be connected to these invis invisible colleges, one thing that is very important is to read some of these, these outliers, make sure, and, and for more than just like including them in, our, in, in the literature base, but also because they might have a different way of practice that might push the entire field forward, but they're just not as connected. So that's my only takeaway. Yeah, I think that's an important point is that there are other people in this community of practice that currently there's opportunities for collaboration. And again, it doesn't mean that this person has not worked with James Ford or with Henry Huntington, but it means those collaborations are not showing uh, an, an influence in this body of literature. Um, and, and so I would, you know, we've noticed sort of anecdotally some of these papers that were outliers having a very different way of talking, a very different set of language that they use, different style of writing, um, yeah. it's, some of which was, was, was quite artful. Um, and, um, and, and so, you know, there's always opportunities for, um, for improving how, how we represent. And again, back to the methodological issues as well. Uh, I, I, we need to do better, all of us need to do better at, at, at not hiding these people who are sharing their knowledge with us for, these, for the purposes of these publications, because right now it's opaque. Who they are, how they're being identified, um, is, is, is quite hard to tease out of this literature. And, and, um, and that's something, that's probably the very first thing that I hope that this, this study um, helps us all to, to do a better job of. Okay. And I have another question that I think builds off the last question. Um, uh -huh. I was wondering if you could expand on the lack of capacity building and offer some ideas as to why we aren't seeing it. Okay. Um, so I think that part of the reason that we're not seeing the capacity building is very similar to that siloing effect that I was talking about earlier, that the goal of the, uh, of the uh, capacity building and a lot of these projects is to give them the to give the communities the tools to be able to research interests or research issues topical to them, which is very useful for a community that is experiencing especially acute climate change, such as is happening in the north. However, that that makes it about their specific place, and that might make it more likely to be siloed in those archival. Um, libraries. In fact, a couple of, of the studies did cite archival libraries in the far north as good places of research for including in systematic reviews of a specific area. So for example, I believe there was a Huntington article that, that looked at a systematic review of everything in, in a specific region of the, of the, the North American Arctic, and they went to those archives and they included those. Unfortunately, they're not making them, not, that knowledge is not making it out of those archives. How can we do better? I'm not 100% sure on that because I don't know the practices. So I, I'm going to pass that over to Phil. And sure, yeah. Um, so I'm thinking about the context of a rural Alaska village where you, know, you have uh, perhaps one person who manages the power plant and the, the water plant and is also responsible for their environmental grants writing. And the idea, of this, I you know of that using these studies to help build capacity is is to is to build the ability of communities to develop monitoring programs to collect long term data about fish and wildlife and and there's lots of this happening in Alaska and elsewhere, um, and as you sort of build that capacity to document and observe and record and and analyze and synthesize what you're seeing. Um, that you know, we already understand that local and traditional knowledge uh, is a is, a, is an incredibly valuable resource and perspective for people who are trying to understand more regional, uh, large scale trends of change, climate change, how we respond to them. Um, as that capacity continues to get built, those partners become even more central um, to 
um, to the work of adapting to rapid um, climate change in the north. Um, you know, I sustained, you know, we all try to do really good about having sustained collaborations with the people that we work with. Uh, I just feel like, you know, the, I'm not sure whether it's just, is it just going into local reports? Is it just going into grants? Um, is there, you know, I mean, a question you could be asked, um, to how helpful is it for uh, the community of Togiak in Alaska to, to have a peer review publication about, about their data set? Maybe it's not helpful at all. Um, and so, um, it may just be that it hasn't, you know, we're not seeing the publications that result from these, you know, this capacity building because publication in peer review venues doesn't make sense for them. Um, again, speculation, um, but hopefully that answers the question. The next question is, how do you think it would change your results if terms like indigenous science or global warming were included? Yeah, it's a it's a really good um, question, and particularly in the indigenous science um, question, because what that speaks to is is a turn, I think, a development in the literature where we're talking less about knowledge and more about ways of knowing, and acknowledging that that this is a um, a body of science and a, a, a way of a way of systematic way of understanding the natural world, um, and and I'll have to I'm going to reflect on that first part, um, but. Regarding global warming, I know that there have been uh, previously um, some systematic reviews that have looked at the use of the term in the academic literature, global warming, as opposed to climate change, um, and found that they did not generally, found that, that the term global warming was, a, was an inferior search term, um, that um, people who are publishing in peer review literatures about environmental and climatic change don't use, don't generally use the term global warming as a keyword, or if they use it, they're also using the term climate change. So that one, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that we could say defensively it would not change the search results significantly. Uh, now, when it comes to, can you go back to the inclusion criteria slide? When it comes to the word indigenous science, uh, that is, it's a really excellent question. Um, and you know, it's, you can never really get uh, these, no, one more, this one. You can never get these inclusion criteria for systematic reviews perfectly perfect, right? But I will say, and that I suspect we have done a pretty good job because of the inclusion. Now, if you think about how um, searches, like Google searches, work, um, it would surprise me if we would have a paper that didn't that used the word indigenous science, but didn't somewhere in that paper also talk about knowledge or ecological knowledge. I would be very surprised. Um, and so my gut tells me we might get a couple more. Um, but I'm, my gut also tells me um, that it, it wouldn't significantly change, uh, it's particularly considering, considering the magnitude of, of a lack of representation of the methods and the, and the recruitment criteria um, and the, the two to one ratio of authorship of gender. Um, you know, the, I, it might change that a little bit, but I don't think it would change the significant uh, things that we've observed here regarding um, the, the lack of of data that is being that are being presented about the participants who are providing this knowledge. Uh, I similarly think that it would do very little to change, uh, and that's specifically because when reading the articles that are included here, I noticed that a lot of the articles used multiple terms to talk about the knowledge that they're they're talking about and they're collecting, and that was specifically because of that that discursive. Um, confusion or discurs discurs ambu amb ambiguous dis discourse that's currently surrounding that knowledge. So there was a lot of like LEK, TEK crossover where they talked about um, like local e uh, ecological knowledge, also known as indigenous knowledge, also known as traditional ecological knowledge, and so on and so forth. So I don't remember seeing much in the way of indigenous science, and maybe that, that means that there is uh, a body of literature that is radical in that sense, and we're missing it. Um, I would love to take a look at that, but it wasn't included here, unfortunately. Excellent question, thank you. We have a question in the room. Studies, 
it forward people being interviewed with knowledge. And the question is about whether or not our the numbers that we've seen about um, representation, um, who is being, who is, who the participants are, what data we could get, whether or not that's consistent with other fields, correct? Well, it's hard to say because so, so few reported, right? I mean, I think that, um, I mean, it, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty simple ex, you know, sort of assumption going into working in the north that if you want to understand something about, about environmental change, you would go talk to a hunter because they're out on the land, right? And so you could, you can, you can understand these assumptions that, that are driving the, the shape um, of the data. Um, but as Maya said, uh, in fields like ethnoecology, ethnobiology, you do see um, much better reporting and at least in, I can't say that systematically because I haven't done the, we haven't done the systematic review, um, but, but you also, you know, I'm familiar with several papers that, that focus just with women um, in different, for different parts of the world, even just coastal BC. So, hard to say. I, I have, have a hard time answering that question, actually. From the outsider perspective that I have, I'm from psychology originally, which has very much the opposite um, bias that we research with women more than men, and most of our researchers are women, not men. So this was particularly striking. Um, I know that in psychology, we really worry about that. We worry that we're over overemphasizing um, our study with women, and that that might systematically bias our results. I'm a little bit concerned because apart from studies that said that they were systematically trying to equal equalize the, the number of men and women they, they recruited, there was not really much of a mention as to whether this was a problem and whether it needed to be addressed. Um, and that might relate to the, auth the authorship, that there's such an imbalance in men publishing over women that perhaps this means that it's, it, the, the group that we're recruiting resembles the group that's doing the reporting, so it doesn't seem like a problem, it doesn't seem like an outlier. Um, something that I found uh, quite interesting is that a lot of the vulnerability literature that was explicitly looking at TEK um, didn't look at youth at all, which concerns me because there are, there's a number of studies that look at the transmission of traditional ecological knowledge in other parts of the world. And in this case, there were some in, in the North American Arctic, but they weren't inc inclusive of climate change, which worries me because are we, are we seeing a death of traditional ecological knowledge or are we just not valuing that input? Are we, see, are we seeing this being handed down? Are there, are there apprenticeships working? Are, is, uh, is it still valuable on the land? We don't know because we just don't have the data to talk about it. I mean, certainly um, having spent time in a number of northern communities, um, elder youth pedagogy and teaching is, is on everybody's mind and everybody's looking for better opportunities to get to reconnect youth with elders out on the land to learn about things. And, uh, you know, the challenge is as change unfolds on the landscape, you need to be out there observing it, figuring out what it means, because sometimes the old cues that you've come to rely on are less effective predictors for what the the future is going to be for when the salmon are going to come or for when the ice is going to be safe. If you're not out there uh, with somebody who has some knowledge and some wisdom experimenting and trying new things, that knowledge does not have the opportunity to continue to progress and unfold and develop as the land changes. Um, and so I know that people are trying, they're taking every opportunity they can to do that. Um, I think that the, what our data, you know, the concern that our data sort of bring um, to the surface is those emerging experts have unique perceptions and observations as well. Uh, they may not have the same time depth of ob observations, but research with fishermen's knowledge in other parts of the world like Puget Sound has shown that it's still really useful uh, to have the, the fresh knowledge of the, new, of the newer um, folks who are out there. Um, and so I would say that, we need, um, that that's a, a missed opportunity. Uh, it's also a missed opportunity for capacity building, building relationships for the research moving forward. Uh, as well. And that's two o'clock. So if we have one more question, you could probably take it. Um, we have one on this end. Uh, we have no, do we have any in the room? No, we don't have any in the room. Okay, so I'll ask this last one then. This will be the last question. Perfect, yes. Okay, um, 
So you talked about our responsibility to elevate marginalized voices, i.e. women. There, there may be cases where this would go against community protocols for engagement. Any recommendations to reconcile this? It's, it's exactly what is on my mind. And this is this balance that I'm talking about. Um, I, I feel that. I understand that. There are challenges there. And this is sort of the perennial, it's a perennial ethical dilemma that people, you know, that anthropologists and other social scientists face anyway. It's this, this mandate to study up in some respects, but also to represent community level autonomy, sovereignty, and so forth. I think that the only way to get at that is, you know, we can't sort of not just to question the decision about who ought to participate, whose voice ought to be uh, represented, but to have the, an honest and earnest conversation about it and say, hey, you know, this, from our perspective, this is something that's missing. Um, help us understand why it's not something that's missing from your perspective, or maybe it is. Maybe we need to find a way. I th you know, I think the only way to reconcile that is in the spirit of reconciliation in the Canadian sense, that um, the, we just need to talk about it. It's not my problem to fix or any, you know, any other academic's problem to fix, but it's a valuable conversation to be had um, because it's, you know, it's an important part of our professional ethics to be sure that that's not missed. Um, and it's a bit of a non-answer, um, but, um, but I think that we, you know, it's, an, it's something that we need to recognize and elevate to our partners. And if it truly is a partnership, they, I imagine uh, that the communities we're working with will at the very least appreciate the fact that we're bringing it up. And we want to understand more. Yeah. Um, in terms of what I saw in the, the literature base, I, I didn't see much grappling or explanation of the decisions based in those terms, um, which again, is, isn't to say that they're not there, but just that they weren't cited as often as perhaps they needed to be. Um, and I also, at this point, I kind of want to talk from my psychological perspective and say, it's valuable to, uh, to understand that there's going to be a range of approaches across the field um, and that we should value all, all um, balances of that um, as long as nobody is being harmed. To say that what we're, we choose as researchers is what is definitely right for the communities and our per professional ethics is a really complicated and sticky situation for us to get into. But if we say, oh, hey, maybe with this community that does, because I know that in this area, if, if you're in Saskatoon, gender roles within indigenous communities are very valued. They're a very integral part to community and to culture and to spiritual, uh, spirituality. However, where I grew up in Southwestern Ontario, they weren't as much. And these same divisions across will happen across the Arctic, across the world. And we shouldn't bring our, our understanding and our assumptions about their culture and expect that that's why, what we need to do. We should op openly have that discussion and allow that to come out naturally. And if it is part of that spirituality, that culture, then we accept that and we respect that and we explain that in our literature. And that kind of gives us a way to balance our right and this and you know if anything the the solution is just we are, it's in the paper we see we see how many people are we see the gender breakdown it's published you know that we had that conversation this is why we expertise was defined this way and to, it, right now it's not in there at all and and maybe people are having that conversation we don't know if if they are though because it's not in the paper and so until we do a better job of at least reporting how we're doing these studies and how we're having these difficult, conver not difficult, but intricate conversations uh, with our community partners and, and put that in the paper because it's guidance for other people who are trying to do this work uh, to do it in a respectful way, to do it in a way that it promotes reconciliation. Uh, until we get there, it, you know, you know we're, we're kind of stuck. So thank, every thank you everyone that came out and thank Thank you, everyone who's still online, yeah, uh, sticking around for our, our last couple questions.